So I'll just uh, start off this way. My, my, uh, my scientific credentials are pretty sparse. This is about all I've got. Um, there's a story behind that that I won't tell. Um, I'm pretty much a Microsoft, a Microsoft certified computer guy with a really serious love for science research and arguing. Um, and I really just have a compulsive need to tell people about it. Um, this is a, I'm sometimes told I'm full of hot air. There will be puns tonight. Feel free to chuckle or sigh. It's going to happen. Um, I'm also going to do my best. My goal tonight is to get you at least mildly acquainted with uh, a good number of the medical claims that you will experience, that you'll encounter out in the wild. And really, my only goal is to hopefully arm you with a little bit of a little bit of information and a couple of different perspectives so that you might be able to think more critically in that way and make better health decisions for yourself. Um, I don't expect anyone to necessarily go the same way that I go, but I'm going to give you some perspectives and you'll either agree, you'll disagree, uh, or you'll go and read the, the details for yourself. That said, this is a pretty sciencey talk, so go ahead and put on your thinking caps. Puns all the way through, I'm not going to let up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, you can't have science-based medicine without the science. Does anybody remember the scientific method? Anybody, the steps from elementary school? All right, conveniently here, all this stuff flowchart style. In case you didn't remember, go ahead and study it up because that's pretty much what we're going to go over. Um, the important part is this. You might notice that a lot of, you hear a lot of talk about really, really specific studies and sometimes they're just comedically specific. Um, some stuff like, uh, you know, testing the viscosity of uh, ketchup rolling downhill. Um, <laughs> the point is experiments are very specific because in order to test something well, uh, the thing has to be isolated as much as possible from any other influencers. Uh, that brings us to what the crux is of the talk today. That is this wonderful little thing called an indication. Area, something like that. Um, in the medical industry, an indication is a valid reason to employ a treatment, whether it's a surgery or a drug or whatever it might be. Uh, for example, diabetes is an indication for which insulin might be used, and a torn ligament is something for which surgery might be used. That is your indication, the reason that you are doing the treatment. This is what we're kind of focusing on. Uh, when you look at an indication for a drug or any sort of treatment, the responsible approach is really to test that treatment's use against a very specific condition as thoroughly as possible, analyze the results for several factors. Here's, here's where we're looking. Okay, first off, what are the benefits? That's question number one. These are your big three. These are what we're going to be harping on all night. When we're looking at a scientific or a medical claim, what are the benefits? Get down to brass tacks. Number two, what are the risks involved? How adverse are the reactions? How do they interact with other drugs? How do they interact with other treatments? Um, and, and do they outweigh the benefit that's given? Um, number three, do the given benefits and risks perform better than the existing treatments for that same indication? We're going to be looking at those three points, and that's what's going to tell us if that treatment, if that drug is worth a crap. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. First question, is it, a, is it effective? I'm going to cut out there. Uh, is, this is why you why you often hear those those crazy uh, uh, crazy uh, studies happening, um, and that's why we're going to talk a little bit about clinical trials and why they're a little bit odd but awesome. Second topic: What are the risks? Uh, even a very effective treatment for any indication can become undesirable if the effects are worse than the benefit that's given, um, or if they interact unexpectedly or dangerously with another treatment, or if it turns out that you're allergic to the darn thing. Um, lastly, it seems like uh, a little bit almost too much of a common sense approach, but um, it's often forgotten that considering alternative therapies, um, is it a better treatment all in all when compared to others for this particular indication? For this, we're looking for either better effectiveness with the same side effects. We're looking for the same effectiveness with fewer side effects, or in some cases, like in the case of uh, where people might be allergic, um, we might be looking for the same kind of effectiveness, maybe comparable side effects, but it works with, with, with uh, other treatments that the primary 
uh, treatment might not work with. Uh, of course, other factors can complicate. Um, one of the big deals that, that you'll run into is uh, cost is a limiting factor for a lot of people. Um, rarity is a really big concern. Um, and the other factors that might come into, into play there. Uh, for example, the, uh, there's a fellow that became immune to AIDS after getting a bone marrow transplant. Um, now, awesome, he's immune to AIDS, but bone marrow transplants are really expensive, really painful, take a lot of rehabilitation, so it's not exactly a useful preventative measure. So that's the other thing that we're looking for when we're talking about, is this a useful drug? Um, or is this a useful treatment? Um, last thing, I, I don't want anybody to miss this. Um, uh, the importance of employing the scientific method is not just to determine how well something works. The other part is to determine why it works. In order for us to have a good treatment, we don't just need to know that it gets us results. In this day and age, we've got, we've got the technology, we've got the know-how, we've got the resources. In order for something to be useful, we need to know what the mechanism is, why it works. Because once we know what the mechanism is, why it works, we can then talk about how we can improve upon that same treatment, distill it, purify it, make it better. So uh, anyway, we can maximize that. Uh, let's talk more about this concept of the indication. Nope, wrong one. Hold on. We're going to come back to that. Um, <laughs> Here's the concept in general terms on the indication. Um, it happens in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, one way that you can get essentially approved for indication is uh, when you're actively working to find a solution for a particular problem. Uh, the story, there's a story that's referenced on FDA.gov that's, I'm not going to get it in nearly as much detail, but uh, basically um, osteoporosis is a common ailment that, that affects a lot of people. One of the most, uh, or I mean the primary line of defense is employing uh, estrogen um, to prevent the loss of bone density. Um, but some people just don't respond to that. Some people can't absorb it, some might uh, react adversely. So there was a, a really big concerted effort to find an alternate solution. Well, it turns out that, um, that humans and other creatures produce a hormone called calcitonin. Um, and it turns out that salmon make a form of uh, calcitonin that's you know, 30 times more, more potent than human calcitonin. So that was the, the, the method they that they chose to uh, pursue. Found out that it could, be, uh, it could be distilled down, it could be concentrated, and it could be used for treatment. Um, so someone found, found a way to synthesize it. We've got several different dosage forms now. Um, each form, when it's submitted, has to be submitted as an investigational drug. Now, bear with me, this is the heavy information part. I'll get back to really bad puns in a minute. Um, so anyway, you have to submit, whenever you've got a new dosage form or a new treatment, you've got to submit it as an investigational new drug to the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Um, and they're going to look at your preliminary data. They're going to grant you a basically um, the ability to research this really heavily. Um, then you can start your clinical trials. Clinical trials are a great and wonderful thing. Um, that's where we get to really take the scientific method down to its core. It's where we, we've, we've already got our hypothesis, we think this thing is going to work, and then we get to just test the snot out of it. Um, in these, the scientists will isolate the active ingredient from as many influencing factors as they possibly can, um, and they're going to get uh, Gonna, they're going to get an idea of whether this drug is going to be effective for the indication that they're researching in the case of osteoporosis and our uh, salmon, cal salmon calcitonin. Anyway, so it's repeated not just exactly, but you've got to repeat it exactly again with a larger sample size. Then you've got to repeat it with small variations to decide is this thing exactly working right. So the other thing that we've got to worry about is we've got to test it against an inactive ingredient uh, in many cases uh, to, to basically to test against the placebo effect, which let's see if we've got, no, that's the wrong one. Where am I? There we go, the placebo effect. That's the wrong placebo effect. That's the bad placebo effect. There we go. The placebo effect. Here's sucrose. <laughs> Thank you, the onion. So let's take a quick side road here. Um, does anybody not know what the placebo effect is? Show of embarrassed hands. Not a one. Okay, at least one person is lying. Um, so 
skeptic.com, which is the skeptic's dictionary, uh, that quotes, the physician's belief in the treatment and the patient's belief in the physician. Am I? I'm, I'm blowing up here. And the patient's belief in the physician exert a mutually reinforcing effect. The result is a powerful remedy that is almost guaranteed to produce an improvement and sometimes a cure. That's the old spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. If you believe it's going to work, it's going to work. It's been shown time and time again in tons of studies. Essentially, taking a pill will produce an effect. Not only that, recent studies have actually even shown that, you know, uh, in India at least, um, taking red and pink pills are more effective against anything than <laughs> taking other colored pills. So this is, this is the placebo effect at work. It works. It works, it works, it works. So this is one of the things that we're really up against when we're trying to decide, does this medicine work? Well, the question is not, does this medicine work? Does this medicine work better than just feeling good about it? So back to trials. A good clinical trial will have several qualities. Let's see if we got it here. Yeah. Um, Gift up my PowerPoint there a little bit. It's okay. Number one, a testable hypothesis. You'll see a lot of things that make vague vague comments, vague claims about, you'll feel generally better, it's gonna promote immune health. Okay, you can't measure that. There's no, there's no metric for it. There's no measuring stick. Okay, specific design that eliminates outside influence. Um, if you're just testing, do all these things work against this? You don't know which one it is. Um, control experiments to account for the placebo effect. Large sample size and repl replicability. Um, on your large sample size, if you just test three or four people, um, you're not going to be able to tell anything about consistency. On your replicability, if someone can't come in and do the exact same thing in the exact same way and get similar results, that's going to really shine an odd light on your study. What went wrong? So it's really important to control your tests if you're doing something like this so that other people can replicate it the same way and hopefully get similar results in order to show that we've done something right, that we've found something either for a positive or a negative. Um, anyway, if a study doesn't include all of these features, it's really not much of a study. Uh, once enough data from trials have been collected and, and analyzed for efficacy, and I gotta stop that. Uh, side effects have been compared against the placebo effect. Uh, it can be approved for prescription use. In our case of salmon, uh, calcitonin, uh, this is repeated every time that a new dosage form, because your different dosage forms are going to absorb differently, and you might have different side effects. Um, so it's, it's quite a road from uh, hypothesis to indication. Plenty can go wrong to cause the drug to never hit market. Um, if you're a selfless humanist, this may, you may believe that drug companies want to help people get better. If you're a pure capitalist, it's hard to believe a company doesn't want to do their due diligence in order to uh, avoid things like the recent GlaxoSmithKline $3 billion a Vandia settlement. And if you're a conspiracy theorist, uh, I know who you are and why you're here, and my agents are at your house trying on your own appearances with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, another, another neat example of how trials can be successful is the story of one of the most famous little pills in the world. Can anybody guess what it is? That's too easy. I agree. Here we go. Uh, I mean, we can bring lights down if we want now. It's blue. No, that's okay. Um, anyway, Viagra was developed originally as a potential treatment for angina. No, angina. That's better. Um, <laughs> anyway, trials progressed in testing this drug against, against chest pain. Um, and as they were testing against uh, chest pain, um, they ended up finding out, well, that the dosage form wasn't quite right. People were having to take this three times a day. It was really a pain. It just people weren't keeping up with it. Uh, but then they found out there was this nice little side effect. And uh, even as, as the trial started to wind down, people didn't want to give up their supply. So as they started asking questions, they found out why they didn't want to give up this little blue pill. Um, so thankfully, uh, science prevailed and said, well, what's so good about this? And finally someone said, I'll tell you. <laughs> and so they, they switched modalities, they switched their testing, and they ended up finding out something that was really cool. So that's the other way that you can, that you can through trials, um, uh, find things that work even in the ways that you didn't, uh, didn't intend or uh, didn't anticipate. Um, and I know everybody's kind of waiting for me to talk about the alternative med medicine stuff. I see a few people maybe, maybe slavering just on my beard. It's okay. Um, let's round it out. Let's go through a couple of conditions that we, that we already talked about. 
in our three rules. I think I've got, no, we don't have our three rules there. We'll get to that. Um, first off, scurvy. That was, that's what I was going to here. Hold on. It's in the wrong place. Scurvy. <laughs> scurvy is easy, because uh, all that is is a, is a vitamin C deficiency. Um, back when it was a big problem, people didn't really understand what it was or why it happened. Um, they started uh, just, someone decided to start trying different things, and uh, among them was lemons. That was actually the first clinical trial. Uh, really neat story. They actually go through it in detail in, um, in one of my favorite books that I've got in my bag over there uh, called Trick or Treatment. Really cool. If you like this stuff, give it a read, because I found out after I put most of this together that they already did a lot of it. <laughs> um, so, but it turns out discovery was one of the first clinical trials. They tried a bunch of different stuff against it. And it turns out that lemons, lemons worked. Um, and according to our, our three rules, um, it's actually even, even better because it works. It absolutely works because it's a vitamin deficiency. You provide the vitamin, it goes away. Um, there are no drawbacks to it. It's fairly inexpensive to eat a lemon. And it works better than everything else. This is what we really, really are looking for in most of our trials and we're almost never going to find. Uh, another example is, uh, uh, here we go, diabetes. Um, that's a good example. That's a, it's, it's okay. Shield her eyes. <laughs> uh, it's a good example because uh, for, if, for maybe the three of you who might not know it intimately, uh, it's a chronic condition where your blood, level, blood sugar levels are really, really high. Um, and this one's kind of more complex, and it's really harder to, to judge against our three rules because depending on how serious your condition might be, um, you're going to have different treatments that are going to work better. So you really have to take our three rules, does it work, what are the drawbacks, and does it work better than the others. You have to weigh them against each other because if you're, uh, if you're not very serious uh, diabetic, then diet and exercise is going to be a really good option. Um, if you're a very serious di diabetic, it might be diet, exercise, and insulin. If you're way past there, then you know hospitalization, whatever it might be. Um, so I wanted to point that out as an example of where it does have to be personalized because not everything is going to work on everyone the same way. But be careful of that because that will also be exploited. Um, so is anybody having, having trouble keeping up? Um, if so, good because now you understand why it's easy for someone to peddle pure bullshit in order to try to get money from you. Um, e even to otherwise intelligent, discerning consumers, the alt-med industry is, is going full bore. They're not taking any prisoners. And they won't be so clear, kind, and succinct <laughs> as many of us otherwise. Um, so you will need to be armed for this battle for your health. <laughs> and on that I segue, that's two puns in one slide, thank you. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was kind of deciding which order I would use to get into the, the nonsense that we're going to tear to shreds. Um, but I really had to start with the main one because this is going to set the tone. And not only that, um, all of these tactics are used in, in all of the other uh, types of alt med that are more predatory, that are not good. Um, so most of the alternative therapies will draw extensively from homeopathy in claims, tactics, and evasion. Um, what is homeopathy, you might ask? <laughs> Here's a quick rundown, <laughs> paraphrase from its proponents at, uh, where is this, mindbodyhealth.com. Homeopathy was developed in the 19th century by Samuel Hahnemann, a German, um, he's a physician, and he was kind of frustrated with modern medicine, uh, which I can't blame him because at the time modern medicine largely consisted of uh, bloodletting, uh, applying leeches, blistering, um, lots of death, and lots of adverse drug reactions because there was no concept of small and appropriate dosage. Um, Amazingly true, and I will fest this, and because it's true, in homeopathic hospitals in in that century, um, the death rate was about one eighth that of traditional standard hospitals. We'll get into that here in a second. Um, Hedman knew that the cinchona bark extract, which happens to be chock full of quinine, um, 
which you might recognize. Um, it had been used as a remedy for swamp fever, which we now know as malaria. Um, he didn't understand the connection between this treatment uh, and the ailment it worked against, and so he decided to start just taking doses of the treatment while healthy, because this is what a reasonable person does. Um, turns out that doing this will give you symptoms similar to swamp fever, which is malaria. Um, and then as soon as you stop taking it, these symptoms will disappear. It's kind of odd, and it's pretty rare in the medical world that the treatment for this ailment will give you symptoms if you take it while healthy. Um, but his next step was to assume that that must be the case with everything. And this was born the law of similars. Um, and there, there still hasn't been anything approaching a reasonable explanation or a mechanism by which this can work. Um, and again, modern medicine knows that, well, synchona bark, which is quinine, is an effective treatment and preventative against malaria. Um, but it doesn't meet up in the middle. Um, fun fact, and here's your, uh, here's your fun booze fact for the day. Uh, quinine was most uh, commonly dispensed uh, to British officers in India and Africa in the form of tonic water, which um, British officers would then mix with gin in order to make it more palatable. Um, now myself, uh, if you're cool like me, you will also put a lime in there. <laughs> so the great thing about that is the lime protects you from scurvy, the, qu or the quinine protects you against malaria, and the uh, gin protects you against sobriety. <laughs> so, and that's why I declare gin and tonic to be the drink of the day, because it, the, three, the three scourges of mankind, really. Um, anyway, uh, McNally's afterwards. Um, <laughs> so, uh, how can, but... <laughs> but, <laughs> but how can it be so effective then, Travis, you might say? You said the death rate of homeopathic hospitals in the 19th century was one-eighth that of standard hospitals. Shut up and wait for Q&A. Um, I'm getting on. So something you need to know is that before the wonderful revolution that we now know as the germ theory of medicine, um, this is what they had. Uh, Hanneman died in 1843, and the first effective surgical applications of germ theory were developed in 1870, uh, Joseph Lister. Um, so the so-called modern hospitals, like I said before, um, they, they kind of have this problem of doing more harm than good with, with all the bloodletting, you know, they just bleed you out to let the demons out because demons clearly were the cause. Um, they dose you with far beyond safe levels of drugs, you know, there's no such thing as a little morphine, let's go ahead and get you to the hill, buddy. <laughs> and, and sanitation was of no concern, and this is really where it came in. Um, just buckets of filth lying about and there was no regard to it. Um, so even, even though it was modern medicine, and a lot of your homeopathic folks will talk about how modern medicine is bad and how it compared. Modern medicine back then was not what it is now. Without germ theory, we don't have much as far as medicine is concerned because with germ theory, we got the mechanism of how it works for the most part. Um, so the part that you have to dig pretty deep to get from homeopaths uh, is a little more scary. If, if that wasn't enough, um, is the math. Uh, has anybody ever looked at the metal math, the metal gymnastics to make homeopathy work? Anybody know one? Okay, so interesting. Um, put your nonsense caps on. <laughs> Take off your thinking caps because it's not going to make any damn sense. Um, okay, so if a small dose works, like in the case of uh, cinchona bark, in the case of quinine, um, one even smaller dose is going to work better, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to continually dilute it, and the more dilute it is, the more effective it's going to be. Now, yeah, face palming right there. So in our, in our modern world where we understand germ theory and the concept of active ingredients working against a problem, um, the idea of more dilute works better is, is kind of a problem. So um, back to the law of similars. Think law of similars, like cures like. So if we get the symptom from this drug, if we take it when we're healthy, then it's going to cure this. Okay, so we get we get swamp fever, we get malarial symptoms, we get feeling really icky and generally feeling British. Um, and then, <laughs> if we take that when we're healthy and, and we start feeling very British, then we then obviously it's going to work against that, and smaller doses is going to work. So here's the numbers. Get out your calculators, and they will explode. 
A 1 to 10 mixture of an active ingredient is known as 1x. Um, it's called the mother tincture. Mother tincture. Um, 1 to 10 active ingredient to water. Um, it's considered low potency. A 2x mixture is 1 to 100. Every time you add an x, it's an extra zero. We get really big really quick. Um, a 1 to 10 to the 8th, eight zeros, that's 1 to 100 million parts, um, is the allowable concentration of arsenic in U.S. drinking water. And it is not considered nearly potent enough for off-the-shelf homeopathy. So here's our reference point. Um, how do we recommend a 1 to, 1 to 10 to the 60th dilution for most remedies, known as 60X or 30C? You don't have to remember any of this because you're not buying them. <laughs> Um, that's 60 zeros after the 1. I'm not even writing that out. Um, at this dilution, there is almost z zero chance of a single molecule of the active ingredient remaining. Um, so for reference, here's Lake Hefner. Um, if you drop a few dozen zeros from 60x, there is a small mathematical chance that one molecule of the active ingredient is left there. <laughs> it's nice. Um, so what does homeopathy offer? Um, <laughs> here's where homeopathy shines. Because there's no active ingredients, there's no side effects, and there's no adverse re interactions with any other drugs. Um, because, I mean, they're pure salt, sugar, or water, and they're also generally less expensive per dose than medicine that works. Um, so, I mean, if you're really strapped for cash and don't care about results, then you're good to go. Um, the problem is it's also kind of hard to uh, measure real life safety because if you don't make any actual medical claims and it does no good, then there's no regulation and you don't know what's actually in it other than that salt, sugar, or water, which is usually it. So um, let's look at this in our measure of effectiveness we discussed earlier. Here's our three rules. What are the benefits? Anybody, anything? Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay, okay, so we've just discovered the one thing that homeopathy works very effectively against, mild dehydration. <laughs> so if you've got mild dehydration, you're good to go. Um, but the great majority of studies in almost everything pretty much say it's exactly equivalent to placebo, um, which makes sense because it's water, salt, sugar, and occasionally some beef liver extract just for good measure to confuse you. So, what are the risks? What's the harm? Um, if you're wondering what's the harm, what's the harm.net, I believe, is the site um, if you want some nice anecdotal sadness. Um, now, the most obvious risk is that you're going to be spending money on something that just doesn't work. Plain and simple doesn't work. It happens a lot. Um, but the biggest risk is kind of a side effect of that is that if you're spending money on this that doesn't work, there's always the chance that you're going to abandon proven treatments in favor of the solution that is maybe more economical in your mind um, or that's maybe safer in your mind because maybe you've had a, a bad reaction to a drug in the past or maybe you're allergic to the thing that's most commonly used against the thing that you have. So when you abandon that proven treatment that's actually going to do you some good in favor of something that just doesn't work, um, there's the harm, there's the risk. And when that's the case, um, pretty big deal. Pretty big deal because then there goes the benefits of the drug that you were taking before, or the treatment that you were receiving before that actually worked. Um, and so that just blows number three out of the water. Does it outperform other treatments? No, absolutely not, unless you are mildly dehydrated. But at which point, that water is really expensive. Even Fiji is less expensive than that. <laughs> Good tasty water. Costs more, must be better. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Uh, lastly, I want to cover one of the big tricks in homeopathy. Um, you'll notice that most of the homeopathic remedies you look at, and don't get too involved in reading them because um, you'll pop a vessel in your head. Um, but most of, the, most of the claims that they make are exceedingly vague. They're exceedingly vague, and they don't make any exact claims. Um, that's on purpose, because when you make an exact claim, then you fall under, it becomes an indication. As soon as it's an indication, then you now have the responsibility 
to run your clinical trials, to demonstrate that it's effective, to demonstrate that it's safe. That's why they don't make specific medical claims. And that's one of our big lessons for today. If it's not making a specific claim, you need to find out what it's actually saying. If they're not saying anything, they're not promising anything, therefore there's no accountability. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, we're going to compare a homeopathic pain reliever against, say, uh, ibuprofen. Here's Profen HP pain relief. Um, this is a, about 2009 this became a big deal. It was moving around a lot. Um, well, let's see. Anyway, if, even if you're one of the conspiracy theorists whose phones I tapped, um, you have to admit the buying congressman is pretty expensive these days, and with all the demand, um, it becomes harder. So, uh, anyway, famously the FDA sent a warning letter to the makers of Profen HP, this guy right here, um, because, uh, well, I mean, if you look at what it's saying here, ibuprofen cream for muscles and joints, even though it says homeopathic, which we now know means water, or uh, miscellaneous. Um, but it actually makes some, some claims here. Reduces inflammation, helps increase mobility, reduces swelling, non-greasy. Those are, those are measurable claims right there. So they actually famously got a cease and desist letter. They got a very strongly worded letter from the FDA that basically said, put up or shut up. Now we know that because it says homeopathic, there's no active ingredient in it. Um, but this one was just selling like hotcakes, and this little tube is about this big, 14 bucks. Um, yeah, a pretty fantastic deal. Works like a nothing. <laughs> <laughs> or you can get your six dollar bottle of ibuprofen that has actual active ingredient left in it, um, and does something for you. Um, but that letter that, that the FDA sent them informed makers of Prof and HP that firstly it's illegal to make those claims without being able to back it up. Um, and the other fun thing that if you look into it, there's going to be a link to this in, uh, in the documentation I put up on the web later. Um, they actually make claims that, um, if, in, in the documentation for it, they make claims that are not known possible for the active ingredient of which there is none. <laughs> a couple big jumps there. So, untested, making claims. This is where it comes in. This is why we've got to have our trials because we then know what works, what doesn't. Um, anyway, so um, a letter informed the makers of Prof and HP that, that it's illegal to make those claims, especially when they're, they also claim that there's no side effects. Um, and I suppose in theory, um, the fact that they make claims that are not possible for these active ingredients, that could be true, but only if you are thinking in terms of the placebo effect, which that's all this is. Um, we're going to jump from homeopathy to naturopathy, which just sounds awkward. Uh, but you've, you've talked to naturopaths, and a lot of people don't know the difference, don't know where they stand. Um, I'm not going to get heavy in natu naturopathy, um, but it's important to, to know the, uh, the difference. Um, a lot of people assume that the words are interchangeable, they're not. Naturopathy is the overall philosophy um, of a general wellness and good feeling. Um, pretty much puts the germ theory disease in the back seat um, behind concepts like vitality, abnormal blood and lymph composition, and um, accumulation of mysterious unidentified toxins. Um, you'll hear a lot of those claims here and there. Um, naturopathy is the philosophy, homeopathy is the modality. Both are unsubstantiated. So, I've been bashing homeopathy for a bit, and I bet some of you are thinking I was gonna let pharmacy get on by. Well, this is kind of what I'm close to, so I got some things. <laughs> so what do you need to know about mainstream pharmaceuticals? <laughs> Aside from the fact that it's not lupus. Um, it's sometimes lupus, that's okay. Right. It could be, it could be. Show me the evidence. Um, so, Here's some things that, that a lot of people just are not terribly aware. First off, uh, let's talk brand versus generic. Um, a lot of people don't really understand what the difference is. Well, break it down. Brand is the original manufacturer that put the work, the time, and the money into developing the drug. They get a, they get a, a free ride on that for about 20 years. 
As soon as that's said and done, then anybody can make it. They no longer are responsible for those R&D costs. It's all done. So when you have a generic, it's actually regulated. It has to be the same active ingredient in the same dosage amount, in the same dosage form, with the same level of safety. When you hear someone say, oh, I want the brand, well, just like with, with the dang Cheetos, it's the same stuff. Oftentimes, and actually most of the time, it's made in the same manufactory. Um, and it works exactly the same. There are a few exceptions. Um, there are some cases when a generic drug may have a different active ingredient. This is something you may want to be aware of. And you can look into this more, you can ask me later if you want to. Um, there are some that are called B-rated. They have different inactive ingredients, which may affect absorption rates. Uh, it may affect uh, allergies differently. And it may affect, uh, it may cause side effects in moving from one to the other, which is why pharmacists is not supposed to do it without consulting you and your doctor first. We'll come back to that. Um, since we're dealing with drugs that, act, that have actual active ingredients, um, they may not pl play well with other active ingredients. Um, <laughs> you may notice that, or, yeah, it was for you. Uh, you may notice that your antibiotics have a sticker that warns against uh, eating grapefruit. It sounds really silly. Well, it turns out that grapefruit is absorbed by the same enzyme, uh, which I can't remember or pronounce, uh, that absorbs most of your modern day drugs. So what happens there is you take your drug, you've just drank three glasses of grapefruit juice, <laughs> that enzyme is overloaded, you now just don't absorb very much of that drug at all, and therefore you've done nothing for yourself. That's why you pay attention to your warning stickers, that's why you talk it over with your doctor, that's why whenever they ask you, what are you taking? What, are, what is your diet like? Go ahead and tell them stuff like that. Pay attention to the sticker. It's actually kind of important. Um, another little interesting deal is that a popular herbal remedy called St. John's Wort has a, a, an almost identical um, property. Um, I will give it this. St. John's Wort actually, surprisingly, slapped me in the face, had no idea. Looked at the research. It's actually somewhat effective against mild depression. The problem is, it's also absorbed by that same enzyme. It also has the same, it has similar effects, and it actually blocks almost every other major uh, drug out there. So if you're taking your St. John's wort, and then you go in for surgery, they give you an anti, uh, uh, you know, they give you a clotting agent, it's just not gonna work. Again, when they give you the form, you gotta fill it out. Just because it's herbal, just because it's natural, it's called naturalistic fallacy. Just because it's natural doesn't mean that there are no effects to it. You're putting it in your body, be aware of it. Talk it over with your doc. Um, and really just, the papers that you throw away with your pharmacy bag have real information. <laughs> Don't be scared to look at them. Don't be scared to ask questions. You've got the Google machine. Look it up, check it out. Um, and the elephant in the room is probably people wanting to know about the recalls. I'll tell you that most of the very serious recalls I know of generally involve a pretty low percentage of patients and become a much bigger deal when released to the public at large. But trust that I know that mistakes are made, um, as the example here, <laughs> at the top and the bottom. Um, sometimes people go oopsie. Um, but the thing is, just because clinical trials happen, or because recalls happen, um, a lot of times, I hear people railing against the industry, they, they rail against the trials. Well, the thing is, the fact that recalls happen are not an argument against trials. They're an argument for more trials, better controlled trials, better science, not less science. Um, anyway, um, if you're having side effects, again, tell them to your doctor. Be, be descriptive in their severity. I'm going to leave this because this is I'm close enough to this industry that I can just pop a blood vessel right here and fall down and die. Um, but I am open to more uh, questions in the Q&A about that. But I'm going to go ahead and leave that for right now. Um, but I will leave the subject of this comparison. To become a pharmacist, that is someone who oversees the dispensing of drugs uh, that are prescribed by a physician, you have to gain a PharmD, which is two years of undergrad, followed by four years of pharmacy school. Um, uh, assuming that you pass the test to get into pharmacy school, uh, followed by a series of supervised rotations, more testing. So we're talking six to eight years of college, depending on how much you bust your rear end. Um, 
And it's also overseen by a state board, which can outright revoke a pharmacist's license to, license to dispense. Um, let's talk, let's talk homeopathy for a second. Um, there are no national standards. And in Oklahoma, anyone can practice as a homeopath so long as they fully disclose their training and background. So um, if anybody wants to just open up a homeopathy shop, we can do that right now. I've been near the, the pharm pharmaceutical industry for three years now. Put up a sign, open for business. Um, there's also no oversight board. There's no one that can censure me if I do badly. The only thing that can pretty much uh, mess up a homeopath in practice is if you make specific enough claims that the FDA sues you into oblivion. Let's get the heck out of you, but it's cool because we now know not to do that. Um, let's make a move towards more general health. Um, a lot of health, health claims depend on misdirection and our ignorance is their power. Eat right and exercise is a claim that nobody will ever talk down, but once you delve further into how best to do that, it becomes pretty well disputed. So, here's our um, food pyramid. <laughs> what we're talking about is nutritionists and dietitians. Does anybody know the difference between those? You don't count. You've read the book. <laughs> um, I didn't know that until I started doing research here. Um, but and the funny thing is, the more I research it, especially looking into it locally, um, there's some blurred lines, but um, I'm just going to rapid fire go through them. Uh, because if you ever decide to see one, you're going to need to know the difference and who to talk to, and really how, what kind of questions should I ask. So you can become a certified national, certified clinical nutritionist, nu Let's try this again. nutritionist, kind of take the caffeine down a notch. Certified clinical nutritionist by taking a six course distance learning program from a couple of different places. Uh, there's no test. That's it. Six courses, you're a nutritionist. Um, no continuing education, you're just a nutritionist. Um, not to say that they're bad, but you need to be aware that that's all it takes to get in there. Um, and another interesting little thing is that a lot of your nutritionists adhere to this idea, it's called Biochemical individuality, which sounds like a great buzzword. Um, and I've got a quote here from uh, Wallace Simpson on sciencebasedmedicine.org. If you're not fa familiar with the place, it's a great place. Just go ahead and read everything there. Personalized medicine is a code for leeway for departure from proved methods into treating with unproved methods tailored at the discretion of the physician rather than the need of the patient. You say it's for personalized medicine, but all it is is just freedom to, you know, let's, let's try this. Let's play around. Uh, without having a whole lot of reason to do so. Um, it's a little more concerned when, whenever there's no continuing education to go and find out if the stuff that you've been using is effective or not. Um, Learn the lines though, plenty of nutritionists and dietitians have latched onto a, fun, on, onto a uh, philosophy called functional medicine, also known as integrative medicine. This is an interesting one. I'm not going to get too terribly deep into it because it's actually, you're going to see similar themes as we go throughout here. Integrative medicine is kind of this, um, uh, again, patient-centered kind of deal. Um, and if you go to uh, functionalmedicine.org, I believe is what the site is, and you read the whole thing, you actually come away with no idea of what they do or how they suggest you become healthier. Uh, but you have this kind of vague, happy feeling like they care about you. Um, guess what? That's the placebo effect. That's what they do. That's what they do. Um, so they can call it a movement. The functional medicine movement uh, makes pretty vague assertions about wholeness, wellness, treating simple underlying causes of complex chronic diseases. Um, and, but the, the thing that you'll kind of suss out is that uh, there's this fundamental belief in an, of an interconnectedness amongst all of our systems. Um, and one of the actual, they actually made, a, uh, one of their proponents made a big claim on a radio show recently. Um, suggesting that um, immunolo immunological dysfunctions can cause cardiovascular disease. Um, and you'll see kind of similar vague assertions like that. Now, we don't know any modality by which that can happen, and it was pretty much left at that. Um, but that kind of outlook where uh, one disease can cause another unrelated disease without explaining how it can happen or why it would happen um, it's kind of ripe for, for inclusion of just trendy and foreign and really outlandish remedies. Did I break the thing? Yeah. 
<laughs> Man, I broke the thing. Sorry, I'm just going to shout now. It's cool. That's what I'm good at. Um, but anyway, you, you won't find, I'll just tell you this, you won't find an, a, an integrative or functional medicine practitioner uh, without homeopathic remedies in hand um, as part of their wholeness and wellness regime. Um, so take it with a grain of salt or <coughs> sugar or water. Um, let's move on to acupuncture. This is a place in Portland. Um, <laughs> You could smell the dreadlocks. Yeah. From <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is one of a number of, of these traditional Chinese kind of folk medicine, medicine practices that are based on mysticism. Uh, the central concept, concept of, uh, of uh, acupuncture is that qi, or qi, if you're from Oklahoma, um, flows through your body through these 35 meridians. And um, if your qi is blocked, um, then you start feeling all ooky. Right? That's the term. And so um, a, a person with needles can, can then tap into these very specific places that are there because they're there and unblock the flow of, of key. Um, I'm going to sound like I'm just a broken record here, but there's, there's unfortunately no modality for it. There's no mechanism. Science can't seem to find the way that it works. Uh, of course, the fallacy is that just because we don't know it doesn't necessarily mean it's not there, but they damn well tried, and there's no way that we can link anything with it. And there's, in addition to, there's no suggestion in most cases that it works at all. Um, there are a couple of suggested ways that it could work. Um, if you want to, you can read into the gate control theory of pain, which um, basically just suggests that if I poke you here, It'll distract you from uh, from the greater pain elsewhere, which is like when I was a kid, and I would say uh, my foot hurts, and my mom would say, "You've been know, punching the army. Forget about your foot." <laughs> didn't quite work for me. Um, I didn't believe it when I was eight. Um, but anyway, that the gate control theory of pain has been uh, has been pretty much left behind in, in favor of, of newer theories of pain, which um, are an entirely different talk. I'm not even going to jump into them, but. Basically, there's not a good suggestion of how it can work. However, here comes our first divided result. Um, some studies are conflicting, and um, a lot of meta-analysis have given some thought that there may be some goodness in some sorts of pain relief and nausea treatment. Now, if that's not a glowing review, I don't know what is. Um, <laughs> But anyway, throwing out bad studies leaves us with mostly U.S. and Europe's uh, <coughs> studies, but it's mixed results. Um, the problem is, a lot of your acupuncturists, this place, um, I wish I'd taken a picture of it on their wall. They said they were going to treat um, anything from uh, cancer symptoms to um, nausea to um, flu to anything in the world. There was just the, the entire wall was full of the things that they could absolutely cure you of but there's no modality for it. There's no reason to believe that most of it can work. Now, again, due diligence, um, there is conflicting evidence that it could be somewhat effective in some kinds of pain and nausea relief. But let's bring this back together. Nope, not that one. Where's our three? Okay, anyway. My three rules. You know by now. Um, does it work? And the answer is a resounding maybe, sometimes. <laughs> But it's far from proven, and uh, there's not any demonstrated method by which it can actually work. What are the risks? Well, if you don't know what acupuncture is, they stick you with needles. So at, at the very best, you run um, an almost guaranteed risk of bleeding. They're poking you with a needle. What do you expect? Um, bruising. Um, and in some cases, it can be pretty severe. Um, and whatever you're puncturing skin with needles that will be reused if they're not sterilized properly, talking about the very serious uh, potentiality for um, for transmission of, of diseases of all sorts. That's illegal in the US now. I think they're required to use disposal. In a lot of places. Well, that also assumes that you're going to a reputable place. Yeah. You weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't there, man. That was the trenches. <laughs> Re yes, yes, the concept of a reputable black. Let's... Uh, let's <laughs> okay. 
So anyway, um, the other thing about about um, um, acupuncture is that um, licensure is also very different state to state. There's not really a national board. There's not really a way to get accredited. There's not any because there's not a modality. There's not really much to teach other than try poking it there. Um, that's a greatly simplified way to say it, but that's really what it is. Um, in Oklahoma, for example, there are no requirements whatsoever, and it can work according to AccuFinder.com, which is where you're supposed to find the people with the deals. No law exists in Oklahoma which licenses, regulates, or prohibits acupuncture. Um, so if you buy some needles, buy a neon sign, get a tax ID, you're open for business. The homie pass and acupuncturists. Fear me. Um, Last, third, third of my three rules. Um, do the benefits and risks perform better than existing treatments? Well, in a pure cost-benefit analysis, acupuncture does pretty poorly. Routine sessions might run 50, 70, 80 bucks, two, three times a week, and you're looking at a possibility that it might work a little bit beyond placebo. Um, again, let's compare this against our $6 bottle of ibuprofen. Perform pretty, poor, pretty poorly. Um, the only thing that it really has going for it is that it's an especially potent form of placebo effect because of the fallacy of uh, appealing to wealth. It's that if it's that expensive, it actually yeah, won't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving along. Chiropractic. Uh, <laughs> did I hear the groan? Um, this is one that I actually have some some history with. Um, but if you, have, if you ask most people, they'll actually probably tell you that chiropractic is one of the most trusted and mainstream alternative medicines around. Um, it's it's, um, it's well known. Um, most everybody knows that chiropractors manipulate the spine to promote overall health. Um, the stuff you probably haven't heard is that some chiropractors believe that all disease is produced by misalignments in the spine. I said again, all disease is caused by misalignments in the spine. Um, those are called subluxations. Um, you won't hear a lot of them say that word um, in front of people. Um, but you know, and you might say, well, that's just the fringe guys. They're, you know, there's always fringe people. Well, the problem is, uh, chiropractic was developed by Daniel David Palmer um, back in uh, in the olden days, uh, around the time that homeopathy came about. Um, <laughs> some some uh, chiropractors. Uh, paint him as a saint, some as a genius, some as a charlatan, and some as a wacko. Uh, whatever the case, there is very little argument that chiropractic came as a, a marriage of basically magnetic healing theory and uh, bone adjusters or um, uh, bone setters, uh, which just kind of went and put stuff back in place. Uh, the origin of that was, of course, break, break your, break your Break your bone, they'll put it back in place. Well, on the figure, let's take it a, let's take it a step further. Um, on Cairo.org, which is one of the biggest uh, proponents, neither bone setting nor magnetic healing could be persuasively described as science. And then in the next sentence, they say, but chiropractic, which is basically those things mushed together, is. Um, and it quickly claims that that marriage of the two and the chiropractic make, makes it so. Um, dedicated. Dedicated chiropractors and patients that may be out there, um, give me a minute. I'll come back to it. I promise. Put your pitchforks down. <laughs> um, the next step is the flaw in chiropractic is that it's based on two unprovable concepts. We talked about subluxations. We're going to get into that a little bit more. And, and innate intelligence. The concept of innate intelligence is going to sound kind of familiar because it's the idea that there is an innate um, stuff going through your body that um, really just resides in your spine. And the flow of this innate intelligence, which is really, really, um, going through your spine, is what makes you feel well and do things and be happy. And whenever there's a misalignment in your spine, uh, which is known as a subluxation, um, it will block the flow of, of innate intelligence and therefore make you sick. And so that um, if this thing here is out of place, you know, you're going to be more prone to cold. And if this thing here is out of place, and my knees hurt. Which, in the case of purely musculoskeletal problems, may be the case. Here's where it comes in. Um, we find out uh, that, well, there, there are sometimes causes for that. And when you're talking about musculoskeletal problems, well, there's a modality for that. We can explain that. If you're actually sitting like this all the time, 
again and again. Um, but it comes down to the fact that Palmer himself said, spinal misalignments are the cause of all disease. Well, you can kind of see how that would come at odds with the germ theory of disease, because when spine misalignments are the cause of all disease, there's no room for germs to do anything at all. So one of them's got to be wrong. Um, I'm going to go with the one that has, you know, decades and decades of really serious evidence behind it. Um, and the only way, and I'm not going to say that it's not possible, but the only way that subluxation theory is really going to, to convince me is if a compelling and deep enough body of evidence upsets germ theory. And until then, um, we've got some issues. Um, and uh, the, only, the only way that, that anybody's had uh, any kind of theories that, that make subluxation theory compatible with germ theory um, usually use the word quantum. And, um, if, anybody, if any of you were the, at the, uh, the talk of quantum fact versus quantum fiction, if anyone uses the word quantum in a way that can directly benefit you, they're selling you something. Plain and simple. Phil, tell me about that. Um, can I get an amen from physics nerds? Anybody? Amen. 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 <laughs> All right, so uh, we're bringing it together. If you're looking into seeing an acupuncturist or a chiropractor, because the thing is, we do have some mixed, um, some mixed evidence, and, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, full disclosure, I actually had a, a long period of time where I saw a chiropractor, and my back felt better. I know, gasp, <laughs> gasp, you should. Um, Good massage. <laughs> um, actually, still does. But as I look back, I realize that it wasn't just back manipulations. There was also physical therapy. There was also an employment of stretching, proper warming up before exercise, and common sense things like, you have an enormous wallet, don't sit on it, it's going to make you sit funny. <laughs> <laughs> because I was too dumb to not do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But you might need some questions to ask if you decide that, man, because the thing is, back pain, which is really, um, and you'll find if you look at the evidence, and I'm, I've got links for that that will go up later. Look at the evidence for acupuncture, for chiropractic. Um, the, the, only, the only things where it consistently sort of performs better than placebo is when you're talking about lower back pain. <coughs> but the thing about that is, Nothing works very well against lower back pain. The surgeries that we have, unfortunately, are not all that effective. Um, not much is more effective than inset pain relievers. Um, that's pretty much the best we've got going as far as things without really serious uh, drawbacks. Even the surgery that might be a little bit more effective, you're talking about rehabilitation, you're talking about great expense, you're talking about being out of work. Um, so you gotta take that into account. Um, so if you're wanting to, if you're wanting to just, I gotta try this out. Give it, we'll give it a shot. Things you might want to ask. Um, excuse me, Mr. Chiropractor. Um, how does your practice adhere to subluxation theory? If he says the word quantum, you hang up. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you subscribe to the idea of innate intelligence? Why? Please explain. You may consider that when you're deciding if you want to give them your money. Um, another good one is, I'm having flu-like symptoms. What would you suggest? Um, the chiropractor I saw for a long time would say, drink water, rest, maybe stay home from work for a couple days. Um, some will say, come in, I'm going to crack your bones. You may decide that that would influence how, uh, how ready you are to give them your money. Um, so, I mean, chances are most of them are going to recommend either either spinal manip manipulation or, you know, water, rest. Okay, you've made it through most of it with me. I'm going to start wrapping it up here. And you've made it to the bonus round! Give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> so, bonus round. You're one. Oh, it's <laughs> one. There we go. A winner is you. A winner is you. You made it to the bonus round. This is where we talk rapid fire about a few common claims, and I'm going to yell like a cranky old man. Yes. Yay. Fab diets. 
Stay for today is that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Losing weight is common sense eating and hard work. Most of your fad diets are some form of malnutrition or other. Um, consult the doctor before doing any weight loss program. If it's illegal here, you can probably assume that it's not innocuous. Um, that Chinese medicine that you're bringing in that's supposed to make you lose 20 pounds may just well be amphetamines. Um, <laughs> um, other things. Um, energy. Energy. No, really, if there's not a lot of math involved, it's not quantum. If there's not a lot of math involved, it's probably not a real thing. Um, leave your crystals next to your ceramic dragons, please. <laughs> There's no evidence that they do anything other than sit there and look pretty, although if you run a small current through quartz, it will run your watch. Um, so this is a real thing in a real place, real quick. This is a real thing in a real place, which I was at that will remain nameless. Um, you can't see here, but um, that's $17 um, is the price tag on that. It is a little rubber thing um, that you pay $1 for from Livestrong, but it's got some pebbles in it. Um, magnetic, right? Uh, this is an energy bracelet. We're actually going to see the claims here. Seven different Nano. minerals and gemstones make our Sonic 90 technology. These minerals improve the environment around them. <laughs> um, I looked at the documentation just so they did. Oh, you got one. This one was a oh. Bardell's. Yep, this one's a Bardell Power Cross. Um, that's, uh, that's like that's minerals plus Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's extra Jesus. <laughs> No, there's actually one of these. One of these companies just got the Everlove and Snot suit out of them, yeah. and so they stopped making these, and they started making um, for sports. Because these are like you marketed towards sports players, because the minerals and nanoparticles, and they're going to give you energy legs, and so you can run like crazy. Like Kenyans. Um, yeah, like like Kenyans. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the one of the companies that was making these things actually got the snot suit out of them. And then, um, so they took the same crud and the same little pebbles, and so they started making mouth guards, which is a totally different lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> but they've made a ton of money. They've made just an absolute ton of money. Um, so let's play the game. Let's play a game called What's More Likely. This is a game. Is it, is it more likely that, that minerals, gemstones that, that um, are then charged through far infrared waves similar to natural sunlight and crushed into nanoparticles are going to inject you with minerals that will make you go woo. Or that someone wants to sell you this thing that costs 20 cents for $17. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you wait a second. Okay, okay. Um, supplements. Supplements. Yay! If you don't have a vitamin deficiency, you probably are not going to get a whole lot from vitamins. Um, from the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. In randomized studies done with large numbers of people, often versus placebo, no supplement has proved effective against cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, or prevention of cancer. Megavitamins do not work. Or as Sheldon Cooper might say, well, you're buying here the ingredients for expensive urine. If that's what you're going for, you're going to want some negatives. <laughs> Next up, Reiki, detox, if you're not an addict, spirit healing, and intercessory prayer. <laughs> no, no demonstrable mechanism, and uh, it tests like placebo. All of them. <laughs> Thanks for playing the bonus round. Give yourself another big hand of applause. <laughs> so that being said, let's put together a plan of action. Um, what can we do as skeptical creatures to really take control of our health needs? Um, first, remember your three rules, which let's, I think we've got them here. What are the benefits? What are the risks? Does it outperform other treatments? Use the Google machine. If you don't know the answer, look it up. Um, some good resources that are going to be linked like crazy on my thing that I'm going to put up later as soon as I have fallen deadly asleep and then gotten up tomorrow. <laughs> um, Quackwatch.org, sciencebasedmedicine.com, a lot of other neat places. And be aware of where it's coming from. If they're trying to sell you something, be aware. Um, don't be scared to ask your physician, ask your pharmacist for more information. If you're uncertain, ask the question. You're not going to offend them because they're putting things into your body and making you take treatments. And it's your business. Um, if you're uncertain of the doctor, you're uncertain of the, of the practitioner, Google them. See if they've got a shady past. Call their state board. If it's a pharmacist, if it's a doctor, there's going to be a record. 
You can ask what their past is like. You can find out things. Uh, finally, much like an argument, this is, uh, this is what I call the, the Dillahunty rule. For Matt Dillahunty, by the way. Um, if your premise or your treatment starts with a flawed premise, a flawed argument, if it's based on a lie, the rest of it is automatically suspect. You're gonna have to work that much harder to make it worth anything at all. So, if it sounds like BS, go ahead and approach it with increased skepticism. You don't have to, as a layman, just because you're not a medical professional, you don't have to assume that everyone knows what's best for you. Um, you don't have to know more than your doctor in order to make an informed health decision. Uh, you don't have to be a medical expert in order to realize that someone else isn't. Um, and for this, it's, it's um, if you've read P.C. Myers' Courtier's reply, I don't need to spend years in Milan learning the history and culture of clothing design to understand that the emperor is walking around nude. <laughs> <laughs> Large swaths of the cam industry, which is complementary and alternative medicine, they use a lot of buzzwords, often incorrectly, as in the case of uh, our chopper friend. Um, and they imply an expertise that they may or may not own, but you can take ownership of your health needs. Do a little research, ask the hard questions, it's, it's your body. Take ownership of it. Um, by the time this video is available, the, the links will be up on my blog, up on the AOK blog. Um, and um, I think there's, there should be, is there time for questions? Yeah. All right, let's open it up for questions. Shred me. Yes. 